where it doesn't work, yeah, perhaps, perhaps we're still struggling to, to make it work. You know? But you know, it, it is an interesting point that uh, foreigners who sort of parachute in yeah. are kind of inclined to engage Singapore as science fiction, uh, futuristic and mm -hmm. electronic and everything else. Um, whereas, whereas there is a tradition of writing here which is, has a lot of historicity to it, mm -hmm. which is perhaps the flip side of that, the fact that things change so yes. much. So the foreigner is impressed with the change, but uh, if you stay long enough here, you feel a sense of nostalgia and you feel a great sense of loss. Okay. Um, and they're both the same thing, absolute sense, but they, they come out differently. The, the danger is that there's perhaps a bit too much nostalgia. There's a danger of commoditizing and exoticizing the nostalgia. I, I would concede that. I mean, in this next year, as we, I warn you now, wearing my bureaucrat's hat, as we you know, do the run-up to Singapore's 50th birthday, 2015, <laughs> you're going to have a lot of nostalgia thrown at you, okay, from different people, from the museum, from the heritage board, from me, you know, tell you, oh, cherish your heritage, you know, think about the Samsui woman and the Angku Kwe and the HDB boy there, and, and all the rest of that. Uh, I'll try to go easy, but, you know, I can't stop the other government agencies from doing that, yeah. It's a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction, I, I think. There's a danger, I'm going to try to be mindful not to go overboard. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, your, your colleague and friend was here last week, Ki Hong. Oh, Ki Hong, and what he was, was he? And he okay. was talking about um, um, an aesthetic judgment rather than an identitarian judgment when it comes to art, which seems to make sense when arts counsel. But so, in that, in that sense, then, why, why would you choose a, a piece to support based on a, as you brought up the example of the Australian High Commission of yourselves, why would you support a, a writer that writes about Singapore? Shouldn't it be about the aesthetics of the writing regardless of anything? We try to do that. I, I must admit we do that. But um, because state funding is limited, there will be one point. Uh, this is going to go into thin ice area. Um, that would be one, one response, that there has to be some sense of priority, so all things equal. Yeah. Kihong come, comes from a different point of view because he only programs the festival. It is purely a festival programming perspective. Right? Whereas the work that I do, including the Writers' Fest actually, actually is part of a larger literary arts plan. You, you see, there's a slight distinction, which is more about trying to deepen the canon, trying to create, trying to see the new generation of, of uh, uh, of uh, writers, try to engage a new generation of readers. Um, so it's not about, uh, perhaps it's not as, uh, uh, it's, I think there's some difference with a, a festival programming, because you can go, with the festival programming, he does go out to shop. He actually goes out to shop for productions. He can look for collaborations as well. Yeah. But he's measured by, entirely by the aesthetic value, what it brings to the conversation in terms of the arts and cultural landscape, in terms of what it gives to the to the public, yeah, I think it's slightly different. Yeah, well, but it's something we grab. Yeah, if if yeah. you're like extremely, let's say you're extremely limited, right? Then doesn't it become even more important to choose aesthetic one because you can't waste funding on an identitarian literature. Hmm. I, I mean, I am sort of biased. I do think ident identity writing is the worst kind of literature. I don't think it consciously set up to be. Yeah. But it does seem a little obsession with what is Singapore. Yeah. It's such a waste of time. No, it's part of our it's, it's so bad writing. Yeah. It's, uh, I would say that if it's bad writing, we shouldn't support. That's very, very clear. Okay. Um, but I, I would try and tease it to a, a, something like this, which is if I have a limited amount of resource and I have to prioritize between something which is. Uh, oh, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, let me give it another instance, okay? Our funding, there's another dimension to our funding as well. If a work is likely to be commercially successful, okay, for example, we, we actually had a children's author, who shall remain nameless, come to us and, um, and ask for funding, you know, but she already has a series of works which are commercially successful. Then we said, um, you know, we think that the publisher will undertake this anyway and that this will actually <coughs> sell itself. So we actually said no, right? Uh, so th that's one dimension of how we fund. Uh, I would say we fund things which, where there's market failure, so, there's po so that's poetry. Um, okay, but I'm, I'm still kind of, I'm still dancing around your question, I realize. Yeah. It's a tough one, yeah. All I can say is that, okay, okay let, me try, let me try and address it in some 
Fortunately, the dilemma doesn't come up that often. Okay, I do not, for the record, consciously try and, you know, create a, you know, support a whole body of literature that only talks about the Singapore identity obsessively. I think we will all be the poorer for it. Okay, but having said that, I would say that as part of when we look at things, we do wish that there were more works which can speak to the Singapore reader. Okay, let's put it that way. Okay. Tara and then. Um, well, mine was just a minor point. When you were talking about how Singapore writing is so nostalgic, yeah. do you think that's what makes it harder for people to relate to? Because I'm not Singaporean, I'm Indian. And very often when I read Singaporean, they're talking about things that don't even exist here yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like two degrees of alien <laughs> I, I, That's a good point. I, I don't have the answer for that. I, all I can say is that uh, we always tell writers, you know, keep on writing, find new stuff, but they go back to that. Yeah, um, but maybe I can recommend some authors. I, I think, for example, Elfian Saad will have a new collection of short stories out this year. Uh, I don't think they're particularly nostalgic. Some of them are quite pointed, pointed and anchored in contemporary Singapore. Uh, they're called Malay sketches. Mm. So they, they would be um, uh, about co contemporary society for the Malay segment of the population. He, he makes it quite, quite clear. You know, it's a response to Swetanem. The colonial guy in Malaysia, you know, in Malaya, who, who had described the, the 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 Malays as a peaceful uh, uh, something quite condescending, it was like something like a peaceful, steepy people, or something like that. And, and it's actually Elfian's response to that, uh, and 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 a, a very effective uh, portrayal of different aspects of contemporary Malay, Malay society. That's one. I think Dave Chua's stories are also set in contemporary Singapore. The new book. Uh, the beating which I mentioned just now. So maybe look out for those. Yeah. Telltale itself is quite set in contemporary Singapore, the collection that is used for O level syllabus. So I commend those to you when you look at. But for every of these titles, there are a lot of nostalgic type books as well. Yeah. My question is about writing on Twitter. In some ways, I think it relates to Jeremy's comment. Um, I want to ask some advice about writing poetry. And the advice I was given was when you write a poem, don't make it you. Make it a thing. So when you write a poem, do you make it you, or do you make it a thing, or do you do a bit of both? It depends on what the poem is. Okay, now when writers have. Um, it, it, there are some poems which are deeply personal. It has to be me, you know. And, and I'm sure everyone knows Cyril Wong, right? By the way, Cyril Wong's had poems that have got no Singaporean now, right? It is himself speaking. Of course, he. Well, there are multiple selves, like Cyril Wong has multiple selves. Um, but he's an example of a poet who actually doesn't write about Singapore, right? And, and a lot of his work is very self, self-driven, I think. Although he resists the word confessional. Uh, I, I have used that label before for him. Uh, but he resists it. He says he's not confessional. I think you could make a good case that his first two, three volumes were confessional. So the self, I think that's always there. But I also like to write about other things. I mean, I like to write about other people and other animals. And other voices. And at this point, can I just read a poem? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> um, first, the historical background for this poem. The poem is my longest title poem. It's called Queen Sunanda Kumari Ratana. <laughs> Queen Sunanda Kumari Ratana. The poem is based on the real life story of a 19th century Thai king, Chula Long Kong, whose first wife drowned in a boating accident. Although there were subjects around her who could have saved her, they did not break the ancient Thai law which forbade commoners to directly look at, much less touch, royalty. So basically they saw her drown, right? The king eventually repealed the law. Today the monument erected in the memories still stands in Bang Pahin Park, north of Bangkok. So there's an eye here, but the eye is not me, obviously. How strange now that I watch over you, like some guardian spirit, and stranger to see this new marble obelisk beside the waters where we had admired the dragonflies buzz above lilies. We once shared a joke, did we not, about how my beauty could not be real if only one man could attest to it. But tradition's wrath, you gently reminded me, eyes flashing silver, could not be treated lightly. The last picture of us together, I still see with startling clarity a beautiful pale fish in soaked silk lying by the bank. And you weeping beside me, 
crouched so low, your subjects begin to worry. And behind the wet body of your untouchable first wife, set against the topiary and trimmed hedges, an overturned boat in the familiar waters. <laughs>